Hi friends, welcome to the Share and Invite Proclaim channel. My name is Judy. Uh, as we uh, close on the, uh, the letter to Hebrews, we're in chapter 12 and 13. Verse 1 says, Therefore, talking about all of chapter 11, we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, all of those Old Testament heroes. Let us also lay aside every incumbence, that means a burden or obstruction. Lay aside every incumbence and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Well, several things just in this first verse. First of all, we have a Christian legacy. Uh, those who have gone before us, um, those believers who are a witness of the superior of the superior life in Christ. And we've been talking about the superior life in Christ in the entire uh, letter of Hebrews. Those Old Testament heroes saw Jesus at a distance from the Old Testament, and those who saw Jesus after the resurrection in the New Testament. Think about the godly people that God has put in your place and in your path and those who have shared the gospel. I, I remember of a GA leader that I had uh, as a early, early teenager, late child, around 10. And in the worship service, I kid you not, there was, she was in the choir and there was a halo around her head. And she smiled at me like it was, it's okay, Judy. You can accept Jesus because he's worth it. And I did. I accepted Jesus as my Savior that Sunday. Um, she died shortly after that, and it's been so long ago that I, I don't remember her name. I wish I, I did. I remember where she was buried. But she was a godly person who ministered to me. Uh, as a young uh, teenager, late child. And also in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we run the race of life with endurance. We lay aside every burden or obstacle. The writer of Hebrews just recorded the ill treatment of believers, their sufferings and their sacrifices. Jesus endured the cross with joy. Well, why would that be? Well, he was fulfilling God's plan of redemption, and that brought joy to his heart. He endured. Let Jesus be our example, verse 2, the author and the perfecter. That means he was a flawless example of our faith. Now, why did the Apostle Paul uh, also and the writer of Hebrews talk about life as a race? Well, Life is such a short time when we compare it to eternity. It's a short time that we live on earth. And to the hearers of this letter, they were familiar with the Roman races that were, uh, that were uh, given each year. And the winner received a crown, of a, a wreath crown to put on their head. It was made from olive branches that grew from Olympia. Well, in Christian terms, the winner of the race receives a crown of life, eternal life with Christ. Well, how does sin entangle us? He talks about sin, which so easily entangles us. Well, how does that happen? Well, sin takes our eyes off Jesus and focuses on something or someone else. Sin burdens us. It weighs us down. It takes our joy. It breaks our relationship with God. It diminishes the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we live for self, not Christ. Sin trips us up. It obstructs our Christian influence. Others don't see any difference between us and their lives, and sin in our lives compromise our witness to the lost. Well, what will cut through this entanglement of sin? Three things. Confession. God, I've sinned. Repentance. 
turn from your sin, ask the Holy Spirit to return you to full strength in your life, to guide you and to help you make a different godly decision. And then, besides confession, repentance, it's God's mercy. He forgives sin. And your relationship is restored through your belief in Jesus Christ. Also, verse 2 talks about Jesus enduring the cross, despising this shame. It was shameful to be crucified, naked, hanging on a cross, with a crowd reviling you as they walked by. And it also meant that you were a criminal. In the eyes of the Romans, the claim that... Uh, that Jesus was a king was treason against the emperor of Rome. But Jesus was talking about a uh, spiritual kingdom and a spiritual king, not a physical one. And verse 3 talks about the hostility that Jesus experienced. Talks about his endurance. Well, let this encourage you to endure your suffering. In verse 4, the hearers of this letter had not yet shed blood in resisting sin in their lives. They're striving, but they're not to the point of shedding blood. They're not martyrs. When might they shed blood for their faith? Well, when faced with the decision of death or worship the statue of the Roman emperor. Would you die for your faith? in the one true God and worship him only? Would you be a martyr if necessary? Well, many Christians in the world are doing that. They are martyrs for Christ. Well, how are the believer's life superior in Christ? Verses 5 through 28. First of all, believers are disciplined. They're corrected in their behavior. Why? Because it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness, that means right living, and uh, to share in God's holiness. Is discipline whipping or beating or spanking? No, it's correction. A change of course. A leading by the Holy Spirit to make a better choice for God. Is the discipline when bad things happen, and you know they will because we live in a fallen world, is the discipline when bad things happen, how you respond, that shows that we respond as disciplined believers? Yes. Then in verse 14, it talks about uh, sanctification. We are made pure and holy to serve God, which allows us to see God uh, and a holy God uh, to see us and to be holy servants. Then... Um, the writer of Hebrews talks about, well, he gives an analogy to the human body. He said, strengthen hands and feet, healing for the body and soul. A future witness for Christ is how our life is superior. A future witness for Christ. Not like Esau who showed, who sold his birthright for a meal. He was acting for today. Instead, as the future reward, which is the presence with God. Next, believers don't look back at Mount Sinai, but to Mount Zion. Mount Zion is where God resides, the heavenly Jerusalem. Of course, this is before the temple is destroyed in AD 70, with thousands of angels, the general assembly of believers who have already gone to heaven, where, where Jesus is who provided a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood of Jesus to cover our sins. So Mount Sinai is a metaphor for the life of separation. It was the life um, that the uh, Israelites had in the wilderness. But Mount Zion is a metaphor for the superior life with Jesus Christ. Then the writer of Hebrews gives us some warnings. He says, hear the offer of a new covenant. This is the blood of Christ that paid the debt for our sins. He said, Moses warned Israel on earth, and they didn't escape, escape death for their unbelief. Well, those who offer, who uh, refuse the offer of salvation from Jesus Christ will not escape a judgment either. Those believers 
who did those believers who died for their unbelief, they died in the desert. And those who refused the offer of salvation through Jesus Christ will not escape judgment either. God will remove all things that are temporal and the kingdom of heaven will remain. So we are to worship, show gratitude and offer to God an acceptable service because God will burn away all the ashes. This is bother me. And then chapter 13, verse one, love other believers. Verse two, show hospitality to strangers. You know, Christian travelers during the day could not afford the cost of staying in an inn. And he says, some believers have entertained, given pleasure or delight, have entertained angels without knowing it. Now, I give you an example that I've had with this experience. I was sitting in the last row, um, conflicted in the church where I was at the time, conflicted unsure. And uh, my question was, Lord, should I stay or go? Well, then a man came in and sat in a seat, one seat next to me, and he was peace. Now, you know, not the Prince of Peace, but he was peace. It was all over him. His presence was peace. And his peace said, stay. And he settled over me. He was where he was balding. He wore glasses. He had just a t-shirt and shorts on and sandals. And just as I was ready to introduce myself, because we were in the, the singing part, he got up and left. It reminded me of a song. It is well with my soul. It goes, it begins like this. When peace like a river attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, and I felt the waves of conflict, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. I felt well when I felt peace. Then verse three of chapter 13, it says, remember the believers that are in prison, like Timothy, he says in verse 23, and all those who are ill-treated, they have needs just like all believers. And then verse four, he says to honor marriage and not be like the world by living together or committing adultery. And verse five and six, don't covet money. Be content with what you have because greed is not godly. It doesn't mean don't work. It just means greed. He, he's, he's against greed. And when persecution arrives and your possessions are taken away, Recovering lost property is for God to do, not you. And then verse seven, follow, the, follow and imitate the faith of those pastors and leaders who, who taught you the word of God. Verse eight, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today, yes, and forever. I had to understand this verse in its context. And in the interpreter's Bible, J. Harry Cotton gives a good explanation. He said, the record of Christian thought shows that men's beliefs, beliefs about Jesus Christ change from age to age. Our beliefs can change. Yet, Jesus doesn't change. Leaders, the people remember that we're here yesterday and not here today. Well, Jesus is the leader who stays and abides. He's God's word to man. God forgives. God's forgiveness does not fluctuate. His mercy is ever sure. The sacrifice of Christ can never be improved. His intercession abides. Our hope and our faith are in him. That explanation, that interpretation was pleasing. Again, the writer of Hebrews goes on to say, reject false teachings and doctrines, which was so prevalent then and now. Let, the, let your heart be strengthened by God's grace. We're not strengthened by food or drink. Now, he's writing to Jewish Christians and pagans um, who had many instructions about food and drink. Um, 
and new converts that had no restrictions at all about food and drink. He says, we're strengthened by God's grace. Then he goes on to say that animals were sacrificed on the altar for people's sins by the high priest. The blood was sprinkled on the altar and the carcass of the animal was burned outside the camp, sort of like in the wilderness, uh, the tabernacle in the wilderness. Jesus was sacrificed and his blood sanctifies the believers. Jesus was sacrificed outside the city walls to the place of the skull, a place where all crucifixions happened because that's where the hole was to put the cross on. Jesus became the offering for sin. We as believers join Jesus bearing his disgrace of crucifixion. This life is not lasting. So we are seeking a future life with Christ in heaven. Through Jesus, we praise God and thank Jesus for his sacrifice. We have service of being good and sharing that pleases God. He says to obey your pastors or who, who are responsible to you and give an account to God for their service. They should be joyful because they are responsible to God for their service to us. The writer asks for the hearers of this letter to pray for him, to have a good conscience in his actions so that he can join them sooner. And again, he talks about this letter probably coming from Italy. Well, let's review for chapters 12 and 13 because believers have a superior life in Jesus Christ. We have a Christian legacy. We're winning the race of life and we receive the crown of glory. We have endurance in the face of suffering, loss, persecution. We have discipline, a change in course because God loves us. Discipline brings us to righteousness and sanctification. We have a witness for Christ. He gave us a new covenant. His blood covers our sin. We have a kingdom that cannot be shaken when judgment comes. Love other believers. Jesus, do, Jesus doesn't change. He gave the one-time sacrifice for sins that God accepted. In a world that changes over time, people and matter, Jesus doesn't change. God's plan for salvation stays the same. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you will live in God's kingdom. Then, the writer goes into a benediction. He says, the God, may the God of peace, the God who raised Jesus from the grave, who accepted Christ's sacrifice, may God's peace equip you to do his will. Follow God's advice to live. Through Jesus Christ, our service brings joy to God. Now, for these past seven months, I've been studying Hebrews, and I've been rewarded because I see that Jesus Christ is superior to angels, superior to Moses. He is the provider of God's rest. He is our high priest. He gives us superior hope in the face of conflict and apostasy. Jesus Christ provides a, severe, a superior covenant with God. Old Testament witnesses had a superior faith because they saw Christ from a distance. Believers have a superior faith in Christ as they witness the, witness the sacrifice that he made. And we are witnesses of this, which the writer of Hebrews talks about for us and his atonement for our sin. And we witness it as we are inspired and inhabited by the Holy Spirit that, con that convicts us of our sin and shows us Christ, Jesus Christ as the superior uh, man. This writer gives us a fuller picture of Jesus Christ for his importance for our belief, for his sacrifice for Old Testament and New Testament believers and for us today. And this is the purpose of the Bible to introduce us to the love of God through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. He saved us from a life of darkness to a life of light when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So Hebrews, the letter, has been inspiring. And I hope that it has been inspiring to you. 
be sure to read Hebrews. Thank you for watching. Have a great day, and I look forward to our next series in the New Testament.